Welcome to the continuation of this practicum. The question, how can we propose from this image alone a process of establishing a diagnosis? In this third and last part of this presentation, we are going to focus on presenting a hypothetical pathogenesis etiology and diagnosis on the basis of this portrait. We invite you, however, to see part A and B because they contain presentations and interpretations that will make the following much easier to understand and memorize. I'd like to introduce myself and invite you, if you'd like to know more about me, to visit the website link to which is shown below. I also want to call attention to the nomenclature or terminology already touched upon in the previous presentations. <clears throat> I invite you to go there or visit Pandora Word Box to grasp the implications of these notions. The facts we present are found in clinical eye openers in the perspective of clinical aspects and in Pandora Word Box in the perspective of terminology. Another reminder to those who may have just joined us is that in part one, we have explained and demonstrated how the definitions and terminologies we are using and promoting here can be explored in the Pandora Word Box website. There are short definitions, there are the roots of these words that helps understanding and memorization as shown in here. There are overviews, which are broad perspectives like physiology, pathology, and so forth. And then there's the galaxy of illuminations that is cluster of words that illuminate each other and therefore they augment each other's meanings and they facilitate their memorization. So a few minutes ago, I asserted that from my perspective, I see four signs. So the first sign, and I would add signal here, concerns the large calvarium, the large cephalon. And in yellow, you see variations of how this term can be constructed, the most popular being macrocephaly, but they can be megalocephaly. However, when we say megalencephaly, we imply knowledge we may not have, that is that we say it is large because the brain is large. And we should not use hydrocephaly because from this photograph, there is no way we could tell whether the augmentation of the size of the calvarium is due to an accumulation of fluid. We see macrocephaly, and we are aware that we should measure always the head circumference, whatever it is, enlarged or small, and we need to plot this on a growth chart. We need to photograph whenever we can, and when we talk about the cranium or the skull, we need to always palpate the fontanelles and sutures. And then the more we know, the better we interpret. Macrocephaly is common. About 2% of infants show such a signal. And the associations are very numerous. Here in green are shown those that are most common for us to notice, but in blue, there are many syndromes. For instance, Kleputernane syndrome, what is it? So these associations represent this morphogenesis. Some represent malformations, other deformations. And this morphology, that is this proportion, there may be a symmetry. There may be lack of the genome, that is, no blueprint for development or a failure of pathogenesis, that is 
we have the genome and the genes, but the manifestation of the gene, materialization of the genomic instruction does not take place. So aplasia is total, hyperplasia is partial, hyperplasia is excessive, dysplasia is out of proportion, and atrophy is something that existed that is involuting. We do not know from this drawing to what degree this child may have hydrocephalus, but this photograph is rather classic of a very severe congenital degree hydrocephalus. You could see the enlargement of the venous bed, the impact on the eyes, the child is congenitally blind. And hydrocephalus, again, is not rare. The prevalence is about one in a thousand children and can be congenital, as in this case, or acquired, or in adults where the intracranial pressure is normal. One of the classic associations or concurrence of hydrocephalus is with spina bifida. And the question is, does this baby have spina bifida? If it does, these would be paralyzed lower limbs. Another sign that I think is a signal that I see is strabismus or in vernacular squint. And the question to you would be, is it an exo or esotropia? exo, outside deviation, <clears throat> and eso, inside deviation. This strabismus is quite important as a signal of differential considerations. As just stated a few minutes ago, the more you know about a sign or a signal, the more precise your interpretation. Strabismus convergent is quite common in children with Down syndrome or trisomy 21. 20 to 60 percent of them have it. You see here, an inward strabismus, convergent strabismus. In the general population, strabismus prevalence is quite high, about 7 percent. Most of it is of this kind and occasionally 25% is an outward or exo. So terbismus divergent, convergent. And here is a portrait by a very famous painter, Raphael. And this cardinal suffers from either amblyopia, which is a deficit of vision, or diplopia, which is double vision. The amblyopia is when the brain shuts off one of the two eyes because otherwise you get double vision. So once again, I will ask you, what are the next two sign signals? Take a good look. So we continue. So I propose that the third sign is alopecia or hypotrichosis, and if total, also referred to as atrichia. And if the opposite of alopecia is hirsutism, we should keep that in mind. I will add a fourth signs, a regular dysplasia. Is it bilateral? Is it symmetric? ear or oracle or otic, dysplasias of this external cartilaginous structure are very common and very important, in particular to judge degrees of symmetry. So for this practicum, we also have a chance to look at a prototypical medical history. A medical history classically includes an anamnesis, a term we should keep in mind. What it means is ana from cutting, from separating, like in analysis or anatomy, morphology cut into pieces becomes anatomy. And so anamnesis means cutting memories from what the patient can tell us.
amnesis, memory. If a patient has amnesia, there is no anamnesis. Mnemonic is a device to remember. So, anamnesis then is the art or skill to obtain a medical history. And then, what do we mean by physical examination? Medical history then containing a history or anamnesis and a physical examination. I have a hard time translating this into other languages, but it implies a personal and objective examination impacting our own personal senses, such as visual, palpatory, auditory, like listening to a heart or by percussion. So this is the medical history and physical examination. This is a way that today is fashionable to abbreviate medical lingo. CC for chief complaint. This patient gradually became uptunded. The stress is a time scale. Two months, the starting date, manifestation, apathy, and anorexia. Those are functional or anamnesis manifestations. And you may see yourself that the patient is somnolent and the patient will report being constipated. Past history, normal birth weight at term, normal developmental score as a neonate, growth and development was proceeding along normal tracks, and the head circumference from the start was within normal limits, but not for long. Family history, the mother is a young woman, but she is sick, she's coughing. The father is a young man. They engender two pregnancies, one ended with a miscarriage and one in a live birth. Review of systems, they are immigrants from Siberia. That is review of ecology, if you like. And in physical examination, we already know the macrocephaly, strabismus, and so forth. So now we can begin a synthesis. We go from A to B. A is that history. What can we extract from these signs listed here into signals? So this is an extract of this. This depends how sensitive you are and how knowledgeable you are. And what calls our attention in particular is the origin of Siberia, the sickness of the mother, the coughing, that the head was normal at birth in terms of measurement, that macrocephaly is very likely to be postnatal in starting. Strabismus, was it postnatal? We should find out, maybe there are photographs. Dysmorphic ear, is it unilateral? We need to confirm. And what is alopecia here? That is something I personally don't understand at this stage. So we had A, we have B, and now we need to add C, casuistic. Casuistic is how do we have this reality fit into the worldwide reality? And here I have to add a strong comment, natural history. It is a term branded as old fashioned and largely ignored in modern clinical medicine. And I think that's wrong. In fact, it is most useful. One of the key components of every patient's medical protocol to be healthy is not enough to be physically healthy, it is important to feel healthy, mental health. Therefore, the history of how does the patient fit in the world? How does it fit in the family, in society, the sexual history, the reproductive history, the aging, the occupation, the habitat, its environment, all of these are factors that impact health. And the diagnosis has to be compatible with the natural history. It's simple. If we put a diagnosis that generally implies lack of fertility and the patient returns and says he has 17 children, who is right and who is wrong? Who has the facts? The facts are there are children. Your diagnosis may be wrong. In other words, 
the natural history validates or invalidates no matter what you propose in terms of etiology or pathogenesis or diagnosis or even treatment. It either fits what is going to happen or not, and it's more than just simple medical prognosis. It is the prognosis of the whole human being and the whole ecology that surrounds it. So this is our index, this is our case, and we find through casuistic several cases among them, this one, 1918. So we can benefit from the experience and knowledge of others. And coming back to the issue of natural history. Sure, we have a beautiful description of this second observation, let's say in 1918, but we know nothing where it lived. What about if it lived in a neighborhood where there was an epidemic of meningitis, highly contagious diseases? What about if the brother died from meningitis? Is that a natural history? Indeed it is. And it may or may not be included in the standard medical history of today. And then between 1918 to 2021, there is a review, a medical clinical literature review that is casuistics again. The history of the concept of, and I'm going to hide this here, but if you try very hard, you're going to be able to read what the history is of. And it underscores the clinical epidemiologic or casuistic landmarks. It's a frequent cause of death among young children. These are young children we're looking here. The areas can, the impacts can be endemic, perhaps in Siberia. The onset is gradual and very often fatal and generally impacts the base of the skull causing hydrocephalus and strabismus and we see both. The neck stiffness is often absent as in our case and the leg stiffness is frequent as in our case. So to fit our case 1506 we travel 500 years to see this case and we travel another 100 years to see the review. The point is, facts remain facts. To prove otherwise, this is an instance of tuberculous meningitis. So is this. And so speaks this review of many cases. Before we end uh, this presentation, I'd like to call your attention to the terminology we touched upon. For clarification of these terms, you can visit Pandora Word Box where they are given short, memorable definitions. I'd also like to point out that the mission of MedWord to deliver medical terminology, illuminations, clinical sense and sensitivity in the sphere of teratology and dysmorphology is naturally a complex task and this requires a variety of formats. Should you wish to know exactly what these formats are like or differ one from another, you can visit the companion MedWord website shown here. And now I can truly say we are done. This is the end or fin or finis or finito if you like. I enjoyed making this presentation and I thank you for your attention. I hope you visit us again soon. And until then, please accept my best wishes and goodbye.